The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Welcome to the 11th Regional Town Hall as part of KSMQ's Cities on the Move series. Tonight we're talking about social networking and how we are accomplishing this traditional activity. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. Stay tuned for an informative and engaging discussion coming up on Cities on the Move. about what it means to tweet, link in, or make friends in the digital age. There are many new applications for the latest online tools for connecting people. Please welcome our special guests who will enlighten us. We have Winona State University Sociology Professor Todd Paddock. Winona State University Mass Communication Professor Robin Callahan. Minnesota Public Radio's Julia Schrenkler. E-Strategy Director for Thunheim Partners, David Erickson and representing all users of online social networking tools, Nels Pearson. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. We'd also like to welcome members of our at-home audience to join us anytime by making a comment or asking a question either by phone or email. The phone number is 1-877-4-MY-KSMQ and that's 1-877-469-5767 or you can email us at ask at ksmq.org. We're going to open our discussion this evening by getting familiar with the new tools of social networking. Let's start right here. Okay, guys. Meeting new friends, establishing business connections, catching up on the latest news. Social networking is nothing new. What is new is how we're accomplishing these traditional tasks. Social networking has exploded online. And it's not just adults getting in on the act. According to the Pew Internet and American Life Project, 55% of online teens use social networks. Online social networking opportunities are many and quite varied, from the simple quick shot of an instant message to the regular maintenance of a personal blog. Users can communicate in a wide variety of fashions. Please join us as we explore the changing dynamics of social networking by emailing us at ask at ksmq.org. All right, well, let's start the conversation by talking a little bit about social networking and what it is. And, and Todd, you are a sociology expert. What, why do we have social networking? What purpose does it fill? What are some of the traditional ways that we've done this in the past? Well, um, I think social networking has no doubt many, many functions, but a person needs to construct an identity. Uh, they they, they want to know who they are, and they want to have some control over who they are and decide who they are, you know, create that, that, that identity. Uh, and they need others to do it. Uh, you would not have an identity without being able to network with others. Also, um, I think you need to have control over the external world around you. And by being able to network, uh, form alliances, um, large or small, you have more control over what uh, of your external environment. You need to process. Things happen to us every day and we need to um, communicate that to others and get their reactions, listen to others. Uh, also, humans like rituals and I think that um, social rituals are, are most important for them. Um, a coffee shop, a, uh, a neighbor whose house you walk over to every day and said a few words to, now that may be done through social networking instead. I mean, a, a social networking tool of the kind we're going to describe tonight. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the place. It, it can be a ritual. Every day I go to this virtual place and I have these um, interactions. Uh, 
that, that's another, um, it's a ritual, it brings you pleasure. So those are some things that, that come to mind. Okay. Now, David, you I try to imagine. I know e strategy is your life these days. But mm -hmm. try to imagine before then. How, what are what are some of the ways that you kind of got together with friends and and got information and yeah, old, old school technology <laughs> like a telephone, <laughs> running across the street to uh, to knock on my friend's door. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as you said, there's plenty of benefits from uh, social traditional social networking. People want to connect. People want to uh, uh, find people like me. People want to find people uh, who have the same interests, same topics, live geographically. There's all kinds of connections that people want to make. And so that tradi you know, traditional social networking has played that role. Uh, the social networking online amplifies it. It's sort of that type of social networking on steroids. <laughs> steroids. I can give you an example of, um, of I think in the, the old school, I, I was going door to door. I was actually canvassing. I won't, I won't say why, but I walked up onto someone's porch and knocked, a total stranger, and they said, come on in. Didn't ask who I was, just said, come on in. And I walked into their house, which felt very strange to me, but I did it. And then, and there was an older couple sitting in chairs, just sitting in, in a room, and they, they said, oh, we thought you were our neighbors. And clearly this was a ritual they had, uh, I think every evening, one, or more neighbors would come over to their house, and they just, and we expected them. Um, that's that's what they that's what they did. Now, Julia, you and and I understand you, Robin, also have a news background as well. Yes. News gathering is one of the things that we do, kind of in social networking, and a little gossip, a little news, a little information. That's occurring a little bit differently these days. What are some of the traditional methods, and and talk about how those have changed with the advent of online. That's that's actually a huge evolution. I mean, of all of the fields that I can think of, news has um, is changing from perhaps a product, something that's done via side streets that you might not know about. You know, maybe I know Robin and I get a lead from her, but but now it's turning into a process and a transparent one at that. So how do you make that? It's not just evolution and slow change. It's an evolutionary leap. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, people are um, they're expecting that reporters can tweet looking for sources. And they're expecting reporters to respond to stories that they've done. So old school social networking, that one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. or you know, maybe entering a coffee shop and people hailing, you know, hey, Joe, heard your show. Um, changes to being on steroids. It's it's very I mean, amplified. Even collaboratively too with Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is a, a social network of sorts. Uh, people can create. Uh, it's it's actually one of the one of the leading places people go to for breaking news, uh, because there's all kinds of people researching an aspect mm -hmm. of that story and add to that page on Wikipedia. So you have uh, you have a great you know amplifier effect with uh, with a world, worldwide audience of reporters, quote unquote. Uh, contributing that story. I think that's a really important thing. You know, news, we used to go and find the source. We'd look through the phone book as a reporter. We'd look through our Rolodex as a reporter. We'd call them up. We'd set up the interview. Now reporters can use it as kind of a call out. So Facebook, mm -hmm. a lot of reporters are, I'm looking for someone who can talk about XYZ. And the next thing you know, within moments, you're getting feedback already. So news has become much more of a conversation and less of, I'm just a reporter delivering the information, and now it's a conversation between me and my audience. And I think that's really important. Breaking news is, is amazing, what is happening in the news business. Um, in Winona, we had those floods about two years ago, and some of the first pictures that came out of the cities right. really came from people with a cell phone or a digital camera, and they uploaded them to WCCO or KSTP, mm -hmm. and immediately those images were out there. So it also is a tool for our audience to really be a part and help contribute and create some of the content that we're airing at 6 o'clock. I'm really glad you said that because people can self-identify as a source and, mm -hmm. and identify themselves as someone capable of the coverage during the bridge collapse in Minneapolis. People not only took photos of the bridge and the rescue efforts, but some of the photos that came in to NPR's website actually had photographers turning around and taking reaction shots. I mean, that's, that's something that isn't necessarily taught to the average photographer 
that's something that we might experience in school or, or a structure. But I mean, people just pick that up. It's absolutely fascinating. Kind of some on the ground information coming straight from the source. What do you think that does to the reliability of the information that we gather? I mean, some of it is very <laughs> accurate. You've got it right there. But there's a lot of news and communication that occurs through these forums that maybe is not quite so accurate. I think you still have to go back to your, your foundations of journalism. Mm -hmm. That although I might have gotten a message uh, through Facebook from somebody who heard this, I still need to go check it out again. You know, I need to find one, two more sources to confirm whatever is being sent to me. So foundations of journalism hasn't really changed. That's still there. How we might get it has, but we still have to double check everything. You don't put something on the air just because somebody sent you a picture. I mean, we all know Photoshop exists, so somebody could have doctored that photograph, and there goes your credibility. So credibility and accuracy is still important, and those foundation and those skills are still there regardless of how we might be getting that information. And right. as, as consumers of news, I think we're becoming much more savvy about understanding what's credible and identifying what's credible. People, people uh, experts in Photoshop will figure out that a you know, photo is doctored and they'll call it out. And, uh, and Twitter is a great, a great source of spreading rumors, but it's also, conversely, a great source of, of debunking rumors. Uh, you, you often see something spread like wildfire on Twitter uh, uh, that's false, and, and the same, the, the reaction to that, the um, correcting of the story, spreads just as quickly. So. That's a really good point, and especially about like how people read that or, or hear that. I love when I hear people on the news say, according to a person on Twitter, there are five people on the ground. And, it, and everybody, you know, everyone sort of recoils from that and goes, well, we'll wait for the photo and, the, and, and that backup, you know, that sort of the journalistic process is is going to change, but it but the basic part of it and searching for the truth mm -hmm. will not. Must remain the same. Now, Nels, you use some of these tools. I want to I want you to tell us a little bit about the the tools that you use. And I know you're a Facebook person, mm -hmm. at least as, that's sure. one of them. Help the audience understand what is it. Well, I, I <laughs> you know we've we've been focusing a lot on media at the moment, and uh -huh. really what it is 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 about the news I care about. Like you were mentioning earlier, it, it isn't necessarily about the story of what's going on in the Twin Cities, which is what CCO is going to cover. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's going to be uh, my best friend is getting married this this year. I want to know what's going on as it's leading up to the bachelor party, to the groom's dinner, to everything, and you just want to know about what's going on in in my life, whether it's a tragedy or a celebration of some sort, um, the social networking aspects of that are, are obviously vital, just from a personal uh, aspect. From a business aspect, there are a ton of applications as well. I'm capable, at the click of a mouse, to send a new listing to 490 of my closest friends. And I can watch as they forward that on to maybe a relative or a friend and say, hey, would this house be something so-and-so is interested in? And to build off of those referrals and, and to build your business off of, off of um, uh, real estate from, from that aspect is, mm -hmm. is uh, the exponential growth. And I can't, I can't use the U.S. Postal Service to send out a flyer that fast, mm -hmm. and yet I can do it in, in an instant um, online right now, which is uh, very helpful. And have you noticed, do you use these tools in the same way you used to maybe write a letter or an email or um, pick up the phone or, I mean, we'll get into uses quite a bit in the second segment, but, but I want to get a handle on what tools do you use and are they replacing what you used before? Um, when, I, when I got to work in real estate, they gave me a box full of envelopes and cards telling me to tell everybody I got into real estate. And rather than filling out every one of those cards and mailing them, I just got online and started telling everyone I'm in real estate. Uh, it's more instant. Um, it's something I can do re on a recurring basis in a, in a trickle fashion. And I enjoy visiting with these people. These are the people I know, like, and trust. Mm -hmm. They hopefully know, like, and trust <laughs> me in, in response. And so um, I'm, I'm kind of able to uh, bring that back and, and make it personal. And, mm -hmm. and that's been important for mm -hmm. me. Now, David, maybe you can give us some kind of a, a basic mechanical lesson. What is Facebook? What, how is it different than Twitter? People hear about blogging. For those that maybe haven't tried some of these tools, what are they and how do they work? Yeah, well, I mean, generally, social networks or social media 
are any tool, online tool that, that connect people, that allow people to interact online. Uh, there are some certain characteristics that all of them have. Um, RSS is a technology that runs through all of them. It's the technology that powers blogs, and it basically is a content tr distribution technology. It enables conversations. Um, the uh, status updates where you say, I'm in the studio doing a television <laughs> show, and tell your friends <clears throat> what you're doing. Uh, a lot of them have that. So Facebook and Twitter is pretty much, Twitter is pretty much that's it. It's, it's a status update. Facebook is, uh, is that, and you can share links, you can share videos, you can, you can share photos. So let's back up to that Twitter. Do you type it on a keyboard? Do you type it on a little PDA? A sentence long? A, a, a paragraph? Right. And, and are they really just saying, I'm sitting here doing my homework? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> some do. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, 140 characters. It was designed to be used as, uh, with text messaging, which is 140 characters long. And, uh, but you can use it from the website. You can use it on your mobile phone through an application. Um, you can use it through instant messaging. Uh, but it is short bursts of information, 140 characters long. Mm -hmm. And you know, I always say that uh, Twitter isn't interesting in the particular. It's interesting in the aggregate. That is, I don't really care what Julie had for lunch. But Julie and I actually have been connected through Twitter, through Facebook, through all, all kinds of online stuff. But we've never met until today. And so over time, we've gotten to know each other bit by bit from what she tweets. I get to get a fuller picture of who she is just as that information aggregates. All right. Todd, is that normal? <laughs> or are we creating a new way to communicate? I've been thinking about this. Um, I do think that this is uh, a change that's, you know, with every a new tool that could be used for communication, uh, whether that was paper, a printing press, uh, a writing instrument, uh, telephones, telegraphs, there's been a change in how people communicate. Um, and I think this is a big one, especially the constellation of tools that are involved. Um, I certainly feel in my own life, and I don't use uh, the, this is something we might get into, but I, I, I would consider email a, a social networking tool, and I could give you examples. But I'm not. I know already that that some of you don't agree, and um, a lot of what you're speaking of, I'm not sure I want anything to do with, <laughs> because I already feel that there are other kinds of communication in my life and other activities in my life that are being smothered already. And I don't, I don't want to go further down that road. So I certainly feel a big change. Interesting. We'd love mm -hmm. to explore that thought in our third, third segment. I'm going to ask you, Robin, to give us a quick definition of a blog because that's something blog, people, sure. people hear a lot about. Sure. Uh, how is it different than a Facebook or a Twitter because it's a little you know, I want to think it's lengthier. <laughs> it, it, it is. Uh, you know, WordPress and, and Blogspot are probably the more two popular free outlets that someone can go Google search it and, and sign up for a blog for free. And it, I guess I would call it like an electronic journal. Um, some women might take the entire nine months of their pregnancy and blog about everything so that their family could follow that pregnancy. A reporter, um, my, actually my broadcast writing students have a blog, they had to pick a topic of their choice and they have to post things on this topic along with sources and what a blog can do is create a sense of community which is really key, a following which is really important and so what it does is brings more people to the discussion. All right. Very good. Well, it sounds like there are plenty of tools out there. Yes. And with all of these options, let's explore how this change in our social network is applied. And what are, what are we using all of these tools for? So let, let's take a look. Online social networking is allowing us to reach an ever broader audience with our thoughts and actions. According to Resource Nation, midway through the 2008 campaign, President Obama had raised 87% of his funds through social networking. Others use these new tools to find new jobs or long-lost classmates. Many are finding their news online through alternative sites. What implication does this have for what we learn? And is it true?
All right. Let's touch a little bit on how many people are using this medium. And Robin, you have some interesting statistics sure. regarding Twitter and whether they're sticking with it. Well, you know, Facebook and Twitter are different in, in why you use them. When I looked at Facebook, they have more than 300 million active users and 65 million people on their phone that have Facebook. Um, prior to coming here, I uh, did Twitter and told everybody where I was heading. And then when I got here, I got on Facebook on my cell phone and, and posted where I was to make sure people could tune in and learn more. Um, Facebook, 120 million use this service at least once a day. So that's a lot of people on Facebook using it once a day. Um, you look at the average user has 130 friends. And so Nels was talking about, I sent my information out to 130 friends. Well, if that person has 130 friends, that's a lot of traffic mm -hmm. and a lot of networking going on. When you look at uh, Twitter, which is you know fairly new tool, if you will, compared to Facebook, uh, 2008 to 2009, they saw a 1,400% increase of people who signed up for Twitter. However, that same report is showing that only 60% of those people that signed up stuck with it after a month. So after a month, people just kind of were done okay. with it. Mm -hmm. I've had friends that were like, I'm going to try Twitter. And then they realized, you know, I just don't have time. <laughs> sort of what Todd was saying. You know, I've got so much going on in my, in my life. I've got my Facebook away message. I have MySpace. And now I've got just one more thing that I'm pushing out information. Mm -hmm. So the numbers are showing retention is much better with Facebook and MySpace than it is with Twitter. Okay. It really depends on why you're using it and whether you're going to stick with it or not. Yeah. Now, Julia, you had some interesting blog remarks before the show actually started today, and you talked a little bit about the Vanity Fair poll. I alluded right. to it, but you actually had the poll statistics, and it talks about maybe this is a fad. Well, you know, I, I thought that that poll, and the link is available on the blog, mm -hmm. I thought that poll was, was interesting in that the story that it told to me was that the people who said, oh, Twitter's a fad, I think that that actually reflects that people are more used to seeing turnover in these tools. Um, something like Friendster was a really big social networking deal in 2002, 2003. Oh my goodness, we're at 2009. That's you know, that's practically Flintstones technology, right? Um, but these things change. They evolve. They still have the same basic elements as Todd was saying, but it. it it depends on what people adopt and what they find useful. And God bless them for trying. <laughs> I you know, so people don't stick with Twitter. That's uh -huh. fine. The power users who really get pleasure and information out of it, mm -hmm. they stick with it, just like anything else we might do. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. The survey, it said 39% in this Vanity Fair 60 Minutes poll said that it's a fad that'll fade. What I found also interesting about this is the number of young people, more young mm -hmm. people thought it was a fad. And, I, and perhaps it's because some of those older generations don't really understand what it is. When, when you're on Facebook or you're Twittering or doing those things, how many of your friends, like your big circle of friends, are friends online? Well, uh, you know that I don't actually count. I don't take mm -hmm. the time to count. What what I really use it for is um, uh, you talked about how we had rituals and things like that in in in, in our history. Uh, I, I reminisce about going into a college cafeteria and there'd be a table of my friends sitting over here and a table of my friends sitting over there, and I couldn't sit at both tables at the same time, so I had to choose one conversation. Mm -hmm. Facebook actually enables you to sit down at hundreds of conversations at the same time and see what somebody's up to, make a comment on it, mm -hmm. wish somebody a happy birthday. And I can do all of that within 20 minutes before my day starts. Just find out what everybody was up to last night, find out whose birthday it is today by looking in the corner. And by doing that, I'm, I'm able to really participate and stay in contact with people who I had lost contact with. Um, one friend of mine, literally, I hadn't talked to since 2003. He was in my wedding, and I hadn't talked to him since 2003. Found him on Facebook in July, found out he's getting married, went to his wedding in August. I, in, these are just ways, and I don't know, maybe we just got lazy and stopped sending, <laughs> sending letters in the mail and, 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 uh, and doing the email thing. But in reality, I was never good at that. But this is something I can just sit down with everyone all at the same time, and it's so fluid and so... Uh, you know, when to to do an exact count of something like mm -hmm. that would um, 
kind of defeat the purpose for me. I just, I just like to know to who's there. Are you able to find most folks online, um, or are there some obvious holes I, in that network? One of the interesting things about Facebook for people who, who aren't familiar with the application is that they'll actually do suggested friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you'll find with that is as you broaden your list of friends, uh, it actually selects people who are currently on Facebook and makes those selections based on who you maybe know in common, maybe what schools you went to, maybe what your career is, and so they'll make those suggestions for you. I tend not to look for specific <laughs> people. Um, what I tend to do is I'll notice in a conversation of, of, of a buddy of mine that, that, I, that maybe he just posted something, somebody comments on his posting of what's going on in his day and I'll know that person and I might click and, and invite that person to be my friend or vice versa. They'll read something that I've, I've posted on someone else and we're just friends in common and happen to know each other also but never bother to look for each other either. So I noticed it's interesting they call it the wall right. and, and it's mm -hmm. like you're going up and writing on their wall for mm -hmm. everyone to see. Mm -hmm. Interesting. David, I'd like you to talk a little bit about some of the business applications. Sure. I assume that's a large part of your work and, and how do you help, you know, folks use it socially and Nels also uses it for business purposes, um, but I'm sure there are plenty more applications. Sure, Give yeah. us a sense of, of how people are using these tools today. Sure. Well, I mean, in Nels' case, he can he can demonstrate his knowledge of, of his field. He's an expert in, in uh, real estate, so he can he can talk about um, what makes a good house, what makes it, what you want to look for when you're buying a house. And by demonstrating his expertise, he's one showing that he's on top of his game, and he's he's uh, he's somebody you can. He's also demonstrating that he's somebody you can trust. Uh, and in these social networks, by getting to know little bits and pieces of, of someone, uh, you get to get a fuller picture of someone, you tend to trust them more. People trust people they know. Um, so that's, that's one application, sort of expert positioning. Um, companies are using it for, uh, for uh, customer service. Comcast is, is using it to find, about people, find people who are having problems with their cable and proactively going in and, and contacting them and resolving their problems. And uh, and so the, the thing with these networks is uh, is um, they get bet the more you more people that you add to your network the better they are the more powerful they are. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn is a basically Facebook for business, and its growth has uh, has increased a great deal. But uh, that recommendation uh, function that you mentioned is uh, is remarkably good technology. It goes and it figures out all the connections between you and your contacts and your contacts contacts. And it makes those recommendations of who you who th thinks you should know. Nine times out of ten, when I see it, it's right. I um, I, I may not know them, but I know I should know them. <laughs> and LinkedIn has done the work for me. So. All right. Mm. Now, Robin, you use this to all many of these tools in your education of students. Mm -hmm. Tell um, us how that has kind of revolutionized how you work with your students. And obviously, mass communication mm -hmm. has a direct application, yes. but. You're into everything. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I definitely feel like it makes my job a lot more work because every summer I'm redoing classes because there's a new tool, a new way to use it, and, and, and trying to teach them to try to keep up with that. Um, you know, Facebook is one of those things. I was actually um, at a station in La Crosse over the summer, and I was running the newsroom, and I thought, okay, we don't have a whole lot of story ideas. I'm going to see what's going on. And I put, I'm filling in at the desk who's got a story idea on Facebook. And within minutes, I had all sorts of responses from friends in the area, and one turned out to be a lead story on the uh, 6 o'clock news. So, you know, a reporter can reach out to find story ideas or generate sources. So I teach my students that. We also um, tie in Twitter and their blog. So they have to create that 140-character headline, but then it must link them to their blog. So what we're doing with Twitter, at least from a journalistic standpoint, we're driving that traffic somewhere else whether it's our blog, our website, a YouTube video, um, but Twitter really kind of helps us drive it, drive our audience to there. So my students have a topic and they have to blog about it all semester long. Um, some of them are fantastic and we've got like the Warrior Athletics has a blog now and they have to create the headline and send them there. There's uh, video clips sometimes on there, audio mm -hmm. clips, pictures, you know, so it's really like almost kind of a mini website for a newsroom and so my students do that as well. Um, it definitely keeps us busy um, trying to figure out how to use them all and all the new advances so it's been really interesting. 
and, and sometimes, um, you know, honestly, they might know a little bit more about it than I do, because um, they're always on it on Facebook. They, you know, they're always on Facebook in class, outside of class. <laughs> and I often, you know, they'll say, you know what, I wonder if we could try this if we did this on Facebook. And, you know, sometimes it's about experimenting and seeing what really works and maybe what didn't work so well. You also use this actually in a tool in your classroom. You, you had talked yes. earlier about yes. you require some mentoring and you require you know some communication back and forth with you I do. through these tools, so they have to learn how to use them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I found out very early is they're all on Facebook, and all the time. Um, they log many, many hours. So how could I somehow invade that time that they're spending on there? And one of the things I do in one of my junior classes, they all, my junior and my senior class, both join the same group. And so on Facebook, you can create a group based on topics. Um, so my group is a video planning uh, mentoring group. So my seniors and my juniors both join it. And then there's sort of like a little wall or a discussion, and I can post topics. So my seniors post all of their shoots out there. My juniors go out and seek out, well, I could go Tuesday at 6. And so it becomes a bit of a mentoring tool so my seniors and my juniors can come together in this virtual room, if you will, and then later go into the field with the camera and help each other out. Um, it's a required assignment. They do two a, sem a semester, and they all join this group. I have alumni that have graduated almost two years ago, and two of them are still in the group and still are sending, send me their scripts. I can help them. I can still do it via email or through this Facebook group. So it really has become a great tool. Sometimes I think, um, as professors, we need to kind of think, well, if they're using it, how do we use it to our benefit? And that was just one of the th ways that I find out to really make it happen. All right. I'm really glad that you said that because the collaboration that yep. continues, that sense of, mm -hmm. of volunteering mm -hmm. and, and willingness to help people, I think that was there all along, but it's very easy to collaborate now. I mean, we trade links that we need. I, it is, I, going back to what David said, <laughs> we hadn't met before today, <laughs> and we've known each other for, what, maybe two years online? Probably, yeah. Easily. Oh. That's almost a hallmark of these social networks, too, is, the, is being helpful. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is when, some, when a reporter calls out for sources, you get a lot of responses. When somebody wants a referral, get a lot of responses. The more, more um, valuable links that I post to, to news stories that are interesting to the people who follow me, the more valuable I become to them, just by being helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, and you know we talk about being helpful, and and you are your collaborations get bigger. Some social sites use it as a pretty powerful tool for grand social movements. Todd, talk a little bit about you know that's uh, always again right. been with us. Um, marches I, on Washington, but that's now true. we do it online. Um, before I, I just want to mention I agree completely about the the helpfulness and how remarkably helpful people were, are willing to be to total strangers. People are also, because of anonymity, willing to be brutal, mm. vulgar. Um, they'll do things to people and say things to people that they would not do in person. So it, it can bring out both sides. And um, I'm not sure. I guess it, if you're going to be a, a participant, you gotta you gotta develop a technique for dealing with those people. But um, I know that. Again, this is where we're going to get into discussions about what's social networking, but in Iran recently, I know that cell phones were enormously powerful in helping those who were trying to um, resist the control, the oppressive control of the elected, <laughs> uh, the elected president. Um, they were they were protesting and they were using what I would call social networking tools to do that that would not have existed previously. Uh, I know it was it's also been used in China. I mean these are tools that um, those central powers it's almost not entirely but it's largely beyond their control and they um, and so they're they're ripe for use in that way and because as you pointed out that the network can expand rapidly it can be instantaneous um, I think that we will start to use, start to see uh, that use more and more. Certainly, we saw it in in the United States with with the uh, last presidential election. It was not about uh, an oppressive regime regime or a revolution, but certainly political power, networking, 
Uh, fun, uh, fundraising, you bet. It was there. The Barack Obama campaign deliberately set out to use these tools very strategically to raise money, to build followers, to um, they, in Denver during their convention, they tweet, they built an on-the-ground force basically through uh, text messaging by just having everybody call them and uh, join up their, their text messaging service. So uh, it is a very powerful uh, organizing tool. It's interesting you brought that up. When I was doing a little research, I found out Obama had more than 2 million Facebook supporters. So this would be a page in which you can become a supporter. Now, we might not know if all 2 million people really <laughs> exist. There might be you know, one with two accounts or something like that. But if you look at the numbers, Obama had more than 2 million Facebook supporters. McCain had just a little over 200 and, uh, sorry, 620,000 supporters. So I mean, look at the difference and then look at who became president. So it really was a powerhouse tool that we hadn't seen in earlier elections. Um, even during some of Obama's speeches, I had read that senators were tweeting from the floor about yes. what's going on. <laughs> I've had reporters that really needed to get a hold of a senator for a story, story, and they knew they'd be on Twitter, and so they got on Twitter and sent him a direct message, sort of like an email back and forth through Twitter. So it's amazing um, what it's done for the political landscape as well. Interesting. And you're able to find perhaps some groups that you didn't know exist. I was on Facebook exploring this new tool for me anyway, <laughs> and just kind of put in organic food. And they mm -hmm. had thousands of people in this group that I could sign, subscribe to, mm -hmm. or become a supporter of, and then get information about a topic that was of interest to me. So I found that very fascinating. You guys have done a, a number of stories at NPR about different uses of That's these true. tools, and one of the most popular ones, it seems, is kind of tied to LinkedIn, but it's this mm -hmm. whole professional development, networking, getting a job, right. and that is very much on the minds of many people these days. Tell us a little bit about how that works. You Well, I mean, we... I can't remember who said that LinkedIn was like Facebook for, for professionals, but it really is a great way to um, sort of express the need uh, for a job and, and find people. We all know somebody who got a job because they knew somebody, right? <laughs> right. They, they know the right person at the right time and they're available. Well, that happens online just as easily. And it's also a way to sort of represent yourself. I mean, we talk about these social networking tools almost as in, it's publishing our lives in a lot of ways. But you can have your experience up there and your references up there. Um, that happens because people volunteer to do this. People are willing to, I'm willing to vouch that David does an excellent job blogging, right? I'll do that online. Don't take my word for it. Don't listen to the video as much as know that it's always there. He can always point to that reference. So when the media covers those stories, and we also see the flip side, oh, I, you know, I have a thousand friends and, and no job, um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have to see that it's still another way to reach a potential employer and enrich your life if not just your pocketbook. Interesting. I've got to ask, though, as a potential employer, how in the world do you sift through this, this tsunami of potential candidates? <laughs> I, I just, I mean, I as an employer, I'm not going to go around out there searching around trying to find. Um, so it, it's still through, I know somebody who I know, mm -hmm. who knows somebody. It's just that, that what you're saying is that these tools facilitate that network. Right, they're very transparent about okay. so so if um if I applied for a job with you and I pointed to my LinkedIn, you would basically see a transparent world. You would see who I am, what I've done, what I'm what I'm willing to say, what I'm not willing to say. Who you're connected to. Who I'm connected to and okay. and how powerful would that be for for you and for your company. And that transparency is an interesting component of what we'll talk about in the next segment in terms of what's out there about you. <laughs> <laughs> we all online. laugh nervously. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, online social networking has many uses, but equally important is to know what not to use it for. And we'll start right here. According to a recent study by the University of Minnesota, having thousands of friends may be useful. Regardless of where you socialize, unwritten rules of etiquette still come into play. Online users need to be cognizant of what they choose to post. There are a number of things that, that we have seen on the web that maybe 
shouldn't be, or we've heard stories about, you know, advising young people about maybe what they shouldn't be posting on their YouTube posts and, and some things like that. So let's talk a little bit about, you, you had mentioned earlier, Todd, too, that there are, you know, uses for good and uses for not so good. So let's talk a little bit about what you advise your clients, your students, your friends. What shouldn't you put out there? Um, I, I have a Facebook account. You can't find it. <laughs> And, and probably the principal use for me is I use it to go and, in, and look at student Facebook accounts to be able to um, evaluate whether they are doing a good job in uh, presenting themselves. And, and it's frequent that I will go to a student and say, you know, I don't think you should have those photos of you in a group in a house and you're all you got the red cups and it looks like you're having a great time you know that's mm -hmm. for everybody you, you your site is for us it's for everybody now they are getting better and better I mean I've seen in just three years more and more sites will say um, I can't remember the language exactly but you want to see the rest of their site no you can't you have to you have to you have to be a friend of them, then they'll let you see the rest of your site, but um, that is still not true for all of them. And so I'll I'll tell them, I'll pull them aside and say, you really shouldn't have that up there. And and most of the time the response is, you're right. <laughs> I think too. I you know I teach a freshman orientation class, and um, some of my upperclassmen they want to be reporters and journalists, and I would tell them, keep it G rated, keep it grandma rated. If you want your grandma to see that picture hmm. or that text message or that video, then great. I think you're probably okay. Um, it's interesting, Todd had pointed out, you know, you might not be able to see all their pictures because I'm not their friend. However, I'm, I'm somebody else's friend who's friends with them and <laughs> there's that same awful picture. I might not be able to get to it on theirs, but I can get to it on Kim's because Kim has that picture. So I always, always urge my students, um, and in Windows State does a great job educating them as soon as they get there as a freshman, what to put out there and what not to put out there. Because employers are looking at your Facebook page and your MySpace page and all of that to see, would you be a good hire? And especially as a journalist, you can't have those inappropriate things. Uh, something else that someone had mentioned to me is, on Facebook, you know, you fill out this profile and it does ask political views. Are you married? things like that, what are you looking for? You don't want to fill out your political views. It, you may think it's safe, but an employer now can go look and see what that is because they can't ask you that in an interview, mm -hmm. but if your Facebook page is available, they can go look. Um, should they not hire you because of that? No, but you just made it available. So you want to be careful about things like that on your Facebook <laughs> page, and I, I'm not sure that when you're starting to go to college, you're not really thinking about okay, in four years I want to get a job, what should I really put out there? So I say if you don't want your grandma to see it, do not put it out on your Facebook page. And are we becoming, I guess one of my basic questions for you guys is are, are we becoming increasingly more comfortable with kind of a total stranger audience knowing about us personally? I mean, there's a lot of information that gets posted out there. Do, do we not realize that other people are look, looking at them, or do they, or do we just oh. think that oh nobody's that interested people in me, or, or are we kind of exhibitionists at heart? <laughs> I think that people are becoming much more comfortable with having that information out, and and as you were saying, you you would advise your students, you know, to to be G-rated and and to not put out the political views. Um, I find that people much younger than me are much more comfortable with that, yes. and. <laughs> But the fact is that, you know, I'm at the employer level, so of course I'm going to Google you and find out. Um, that's a personal decision, and setting those privacy boundaries um, and, and living it is, is sort of part of that social contract where we say, you know, what I'm willing for you to know about me is something I'm establishing. Um, do you pick up the newspaper in your robe or do you, you know, put on clothes <laughs> first, <laughs> right? It's, it's the point. same sort of thing online. Yeah. When you think about it, this, the millennial generation is the first generation in history to grow up with the notion that they have an audience and that <laughs> fundamentally is different in their behavior, in their attitudes, that they're actually playing to an audience. Um, 
So they're, they're aware of it. I don't know that they're aware of the privacy settings and exactly how to use them, which is something they should be aware of. But also, it's not just what they post online. It's what they do in public. Uh, one of the most popular videos on YouTube today is of a young girl drunk at a Detroit Lions Vikings game getting arrested. She didn't take it. It was somebody at the, at the stadium that took it, but it's up there. And, and she, you know, she wasn't even aware it was being shot. So, you know, be careful what you do, be careful what you post. Don't get on the front of the New York Times or, uh, or on YouTube. <laughs> Easier to do these days. Nelson, when, when you are blogging or when you're putting information out on your Facebook page, how much do you stop and think about what you're going to post before you actually put it out there? Um, I'm wide open on my account, so someone can just type my name in and see everything I post. So I'm very sensitive to what I put out there. Um, I want people to be able to say, uh, Nels Pearson, is, his sign was on that listing up in Fox Hill, and they can quickly mm -hmm. go to my Facebook account even, hit my postlets in the corner, and they've got all the details of my listing in Fox Hill. Okay. Um, so I, I want people to know about me. Like you were saying, people want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. Mm -hmm. um, and so I basically, put those things out there and I try to avoid doing those bad things in public that, <laughs> that I don't want seen posted anywhere. So I guess I rely on it from that aspect. But I do know people who are, they're very sensitive, they're private people, um, they aren't, uh, their, their business or occupation doesn't require networking. So they'll, they're very sensitive, um, and I think Facebook especially is one of the more uh, um, selective as far as exactly what type of information you, you can or, or may provide to not just everyone, but mm -hmm. specific people. You can set up lists on Facebook that say, you know, all of my realtor friends, I want them to see everything that, okay. that I have. So all segregate. my church friends, I can say, okay. I can have mm -hmm. these settings that they know about. But if it's just somebody who, um, is looking for me and wants to make sure it's it's this Nels Pearson and not the Nels Pearson who lives in Duluth, which there is one. Um, th they're able to quickly look at a photo or get the fact that this guy lives in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, versus Duluth. And perhaps he's um, 80 years old. <laughs> no, actually, kind of the same profile. <laughs> he's better looking. But anyway. <laughs> And, and let's talk about some things. That it, it sounds like you can segregate then your business from your personal, so you're not necessarily sharing your children's photographs and news about your family with Absolutely. an open sure. audience. Because there perhaps is some concern or danger to that. I think that you true? can definitely you know, set profiles. Um, Jason DeRussia is a reporter out of WCCO, and I follow him, and we're friends on Facebook, and I follow his blog. And I had gone to a conference that he put on, and I sort of wish I had gone to this conference prior to setting up my Facebook because once you enter Facebook, it is sort of merged. You know, mm -hmm. I have like my high school friends are my friends, <laughs> my current students are my friends, my alumni are my friends, my professional friends are my friends, and now I'm just one Robin O'Callaghan and it's all together. So you do have to be maybe a little more strategic. You know, do you want Facebook to be professional and maybe you use one name and you use another name? for maybe your personal life. You do have to have two email addresses in that instance. Yeah. So you do have to be careful. There is a way to change private, privacy settings, but some, I'm at the point where I'm just melted. <laughs> um, everybody knows everything. My students know things that I'm doing on the weekends along with my professional friends. So you do, okay. you have to be sometimes a little more strategic before you start. There's probably a lot of people who set up so, two accounts, a personal yep. and, a, and a business. I did when I started and uh, I just caved because logistically <laughs> it just wasn't gonna work for me. And actually, I think uh, from a business standpoint, mixing a little bit of the personal with the business stuff works yes. a lot better be because you set up that trust. You, you, know, you build who you are and people get, get, gain your trust more than they would otherwise. Now, David, you mentioned something on the phone. We were talking before the show about you spend all day online and, you know, life couldn't be better. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about how life has changed and do we find that, that people are spending screen time instead of FaceTime? 
I don't think matter? so. I think there was, I, I mean, I don't find it for myself. I don't really see it in, in the people I know who are online a lot. Um, I, there was a study some time ago that said that actually people who are real connected online are very connected offline as well. Uh, and maybe that's, maybe that's because of the connections. You build more, more connections, more opportunities to meet people in, in person and so forth. So um, I don't know, you know for a fact that that's true, but, but uh, anecdotally, I think, uh, I think that's well, the case. I think it's important, too, because you select it. I mean, some people mm -hmm. maybe do, are, are vivacious and go out into a room of people and meet them. Some people, they want that, you know, communication is, mm -hmm. is important and we all need it. And, uh, and so this is just another outlet and a different option for people that maybe normally couldn't go out there and communicate uh, in the same way. I do think, this is where I have some concerns. And, and um, this, and this is probably more personal than it is um, I'm, I'm not going to give you research about it, but I think that uh, you lose richness of communication when you can't hear someone's voice, when you can't see them, you can't read their facial expressions, you can't smell them. You can't, and I mean, I'm thinking in the good way, um, but there are so many ways that human beings are able to communicate and and to the extent you lose those you're losing richness and and that that to me even even the difference between a telephone call and typing text is huge for me and I will tell people frequently please call me or I will get their phone number and call them up I don't want to have a text conversation with you I want to talk with you on the phone there's something about the voice that matters to me a lot. And, and so um, if, if someone is having less of that, with whether face-to-face -face or voice, because they're spending more time, then I, then I think that's a concern. But the question is, is that what's happening? And, and you're suggesting so far that may not be, that may not be what's happening. Yeah, I mean, you know, people have jobs. They typically have a lot of people that they're working with. Uh, few, fewer people uh, work, you know, solely alone. So there's a lot of social interaction. They have family, they have friends. Um, I think that it's a good point, though. I mean, a lot of communication is lost uh, just by the tone of voice, um, by gestures, by facial gestures, by, by body language, and so forth. And you know, you can build up a relationship online uh, and get to know each other online. But that relation, re relationship really isn't cemented until you meet, meet the person. Well, person. there we go. We cemented one today. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it's a, such a personal thing. I mean, what you would prefer mm -hmm. is, is one thing, and, and what I would prefer is another. It adds a level of richness to me. The people that I meet at the coffee shop are probably going to tweet with me after. Or, I mean, I'm sure David and I will comment on each other's blog posts and that sort of thing. I mean, it's... It just adds one more touch point, and and that's that's a layer um, that has its own rights to exist. Mm -hmm. I think we all have personal traits, but we also have lots of choices. I mean, we've all mm -hmm. gotten an email where you're like, "Wow, not really sure how to take this." <laughs> well, that's why I pick up the phone and kind of call that person and kind of try to figure out that tone. Mm -hmm. But tone does get missed, and you're not quite sure how to take it. And there is some confusion going on, and that's why you can call them. You can go to their house, and, and there are definitely several ways to communicate. Kind of sort that out. I do want to have us touch on a couple things briefly as well before we run out of time tonight. How do you decline a friend? Facebook? Just hit ignore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've got one pending, but I'm not sure who he is. And so, yeah, you know, they, they show up, and you can confirm them on Facebook or ignore them. And mm -hmm. I believe when you ignore them, they don't even realize right. you've ignored them. Um, you can remove friends. I've had to remove a few. Um, and they don't realize that they are now no longer my friend on Facebook. So it's really pretty easy to select whether you want to be someone's friend or not. And um, that person doesn't know. Okay. Unless they start looking through their friend list and you're not there yet. Okay. So they'll notice if you're only one of two of the friends they yes. have. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Online networking tools, social networking tools, sometimes people would say they run amok in our mm. regulatory world. Is there regulation coming? 
to monitor some of these venues for social networking. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't see it coming right now. I, I can see it happening, but um, I, I agree with you. I hope not. I, I hope not in print. I think that maybe socially it will force more people to be honest in their social networking. I mean, we there's social pressures, just like there's social pressures in a in a conversation to to be kind and remove some of that vulgarity. If we're all being ourselves, you know, that's. That's 24-7 being ourselves. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. Well, it is a brave new world out there. And here at KSMQ, we always encourage our audience to be active viewers. And I encourage you to visit our website, ksmq.org, to find links to the various organizations and programs we've discussed here tonight. There's links to some of the studies that tell you a little bit about uh, this whole se social networking phenomenon. And our panelists will be sharing some additional thoughts on our KSMQ blog. So if you'd like to be part of that discussion, log on to blog.ksmq.org q.org and share your thoughts as well. We appreciate everyone's participation to help us increase our understanding of how social networking is evolving and it continues to do so. Thank you to our panelists and our viewers. I want you to tune in next week when Cities on the Move pays a visit to the Austin Arts in the Park event. We'll also find out more about Ladies Night Out and the non-traditional scholars this event supports, as well as meet Richard Titus who makes delightful gifts out of people's names. That's Tuesday, October 6th at 6.30 p.m. on KSMQ. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you to our viewers and good night.